to follow their own instincts in this matter. And it's possible that the uh, competition among the states will push them to be a little bit more liberal. I hope it does. Uh, but that, for exports, in my view, that's a very major factor because uh, uh, the extent to which China is going to vacate markets is very large. And they don't mind vacating those markets. They're going to occupy higher end markets. The question is, who's going to occupy that space? I beg your pardon, sir, the concept of frontier. If you don't mind. Sorry? The concept of frontier. Ah, the concept of frontier. I'm sorry. Well, okay. See, what I mean by the frontier there is, imagine you're in the United States and imagine you're in India, okay? Two different people. In the United States, there is a technological frontier and it's moving forward in different areas. I mean, for example, you know, maybe in robotics and so forth, uh, all kinds of very, very exciting new developments that are taking place. Uh, the rate at which that progress takes place is relatively modest. On the other hand, if you're in India, the frontier is known. It's just that you're not operating at that level. Now, maybe you're not operating at that level because you don't have good enough infrastructure, you don't have enough capital, whatever. But if you can improve your infrastructure and get a little bit more capital, you can move quite rapidly to what is a frontier level technology with huge improvements in productivity. I mean, look, take, take medicine. Uh, if you're a doctor operating, I mean, working with an equipment which is 20 years old, uh, and you, you know that the frontier is out there and it's a big technical advance that's taking place, and if you just scrap the machine you're using and put in a new one, I mean, the difference in productivity would be huge. So this is where developing countries have the advantage. The United States has, has to worry about the rate at which the frontier is expanding. We have to worry at the rate at which we are converging towards the frontier. And I think those countries that conduct themselves in a manner that enables rapid convergence basically will grow a lot faster than the industrialized world. I and mean, that's how we catch up. That's what convergence means. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of work to be done at, in terms of what affects the pace of convergence. It's not as if it's simply automatic that I want to be productive. You know, it's got to be the, the willingness, it's got to be the willingness to be flexible enough to adopt the technology, to have the money required to buy the relevant machines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Dr. Olivalia, I couldn't be uh, thankful for the wonderful presentation you did in thrust areas. I couldn't more than agree with you, but I'd require you to give me some insights, three insights on things you didn't touch on. One is, what is your take on the present way of calculating national income? The gross value added method, it is believed is a way to exaggerate your national income because it's not reflected in your income tax earnings corporate earnings, or even ta tax duties. So if this is a window dressing to say we are go doing good, that needs a relook. That's one issue. The second is, whereas you referred to the macroeconomic balance, uh, you didn't talk about India's debt, nor did you talk about the uh, bonanza we have on banking loans, which is le leading to the NPAs and a total rundown of the banking sector. Do you feel that we are fastly moving towards bankruptcy. The <laughs> third issue, and the third issue is, you recall I was, I'm a member of the Bengal Chamber Economics Committee. A good two decades ago, I had written to you when I was a faculty in one of the United States uh, business schools, and I had asked you to set up SAFE, which is an issue you have addressed on small scale industries. But one of the problems with India's small-scale industries is we are not allowing them, and I think that's the front you were referring to him, we are not allowing them to earn foreign exchange through process exports and through uh, the greener technologies. So once we get to that tie-up with foreign countries as process developers rather than product developers, we could be earning foreign exchange on that front. And he had responded saying that he would be happy to meet me, but I happen to be in eastern India. Uh, 
these are the three questions I'd like you. Well, all very tough questions as <laughs> befits someone who was teaching. I'm not sure how you're going to grade my answers, but you know, on the process developers, I mean, objectively there's no question that, you know, uh, we don't necessarily have to fight uh, to become competitive in product development if we can sort of be competitive in some processes. In any case around the world, uh, the value chain is now being split up and bits of the value chain go wherever it's most efficiently run. I'm not aware of what constraints we are putting on exporters, but frankly, if we are, I mean, it's crazy. I wouldn't rule it out, by the way. I mean, the history of our trade policy for the last 20 years is full of things which exporters bring to me, and uh, I say that's crazy, but then they say, but that's what it is. So I think that's what the Bengal Chamber could honestly, I mean, really take up. I mean, you have, uh, I'm sure that the Commerce Minister is very keen on it, and incidentally, the chairman of the, the deputy chairman of Niti Ayog, Mr. Panagria, is a very well-known trade economist. So uh, this is one area where if you can persuade him that this is quite silly, he could actually get to rectify it. But I'm, maybe later on you can tell me exactly what it is, but I'm very interested in that. Now, national income. You know, I tell you, uh, I'm not a... I mean, I don't have any inside knowledge, but I buy the conventional wisdom. I don't think that the national income data are being fiddled, okay? So as a matter of fact, what the new national income accounts do is, first of all, they improve the record of the UPA's last two years, and it gives a <laughs> good growth this year, so everybody can sit back. Uh, they're, they're not, I don't think they're being fiddled. I've talked to... the challenge really is that when you talk to uh, statistical experts uh, or expert statisticians rather uh, not from the government but outsiders they all say that when they describe what they're doing it's an improvement on what we were doing because it's broadening <coughs> the base of information that is being used to compute and uh, compute the new numbers and whenever a base can be broadened, it's a good thing that is broadened. What they're not sure about is that is the data that we are getting uh, good quality or is it somehow dubious quality? There are people who have written in the EPW, Mr. Nagaraj, for example. I mean, he says that, you know, uh, organized sector information now comes from a much larger uh, bunch of companies which report their financial results to SEBI. And it's better to go from 300 companies to whatever, 5,000 companies. But then people like Nagaraj have been saying that many of these companies that are registered in the stock exchanges are somehow either shadow companies or dubious companies or shell companies or whatever. And that what they're reporting to SEBI may not actually be uh, all that uh, accurate. This can only be worked out, but they, I think the, gov the st Statistical Commission has set up a committee under Pranab Sen, until recently the chief statistician, uh, to go into this matter. So I, I'm suspending my judgment. I've called him up twice and said, when is your report coming? And he said, soon. So I'm going to suspend my judgment until I hear what he has to say. Businessmen that I talk to, and they tell me that it doesn't pass the smell test. Because the data show, supposedly show, that you know the growth rate of industry value added is, I don't know, 9% or something like that. Uh, and they say, look, it just doesn't feel like that. Okay? Now, you know, some people say that what could be happening, and this is a cute little twist to the argument, what could be happening is that since there's now negative inflation, okay, so if input costs have gone down sharply, okay, then value added has gone up, even though the, the sales have not increased very much. Okay. But you know, if input costs have gone down and sales haven't increased, then profits should be booming. And these businessmen I talk to should be saying, well, there isn't much growth, but profits are great. They're not saying that. And the revenues don't show it either. Now, the only way this can be uh, tied up is if input costs are going down, profits are being squeezed because of competition, 
But then labor must be having a ball. But none of the trade union guys I talk to are saying that either. So <laughs> there is a problem. And I think we must wait for Pranab Sen's He's a first-rate guy, so I'm sure he's going to somehow or the other address it. But that's, that's the bottom line, uh, and that's the problem. Now, you talked about uh, macro balance, and I mean, uh, yeah, uh, let me say what I, what I meant by macro balance. Number one, the fiscal deficit, I mean, the standard stuff. That has to be reasonable. What is reasonable, you can argue about, but you know, if you said this is reasonable, then you should stick to it, and that was what the debate was all about. The other aspect of macro balance is the current account deficit. I mean, you can have a fiscal deficit that's okay, but you could be uh, shot to hell on the current account deficit. That's not the problem today, thanks to the low oil prices, okay? So that part is all right. Now you went um, very correctly to a weak spot, and that is the banking system. That is a big problem. I mean, but let me say, I don't think uh, that uh, we're bankrupt. What it does show is that we've got a problem. That problem will have to be tackled. It has to be tackled in a, both in a quick way and in a sensitive way. The worst thing to do is not to tackle it by allowing all sorts of regulatory fiddles and the banks just pretend they're lending to over evergreen rules. Then nothing happens, okay? And I think if we tackle that, it will put a strain but I don't think that uh, India would as a result be bankrupted because the Indian debt ratios are not, they're high. And I'm writing a piece on this which is going to come out in a day or so. Indian debt ratios are high. But unlike other countries, our debt, government debt is not foreign currency denominated. It's actually all rupee, most of it is rupee denominated. And that makes it a lot easier to handle the situation over time, especially if the macro balance is kept uh, in check. What it does mean is that you need to give priority uh, to fixing the banking system. But the most important thing is that it's not fixing the hole that has been created. It's making sure that the system is immune, sufficiently immune to not repeating these holes. And that's where I think the government has major challenges because Raghuram Rajan had appointed a committee by, headed by P.J. Nayak on <coughs> governance reform in the public sector banks. That committee laid out a very extensive, I mean, there are a bunch of experts who know what they're talking about, laid out a pretty bold set of reforms on the governance of public sector banks, which in their view were necessary if you wanted the banks to become truly independent and commercially sensitive and all the rest of it. Now, whether we're going to be able to do, I haven't seen any discussion on whether any of those recommendations are politically acceptable. And I should say, by the way, that that's also a multi-party problem. It's in the, the core and crux of what uh, PJ Nayak says is that as long as the government retains control and direction over public sector banks, uh, you will not be able to improve the situation. Now, to give up that control, and in his view, should give up uh, big time. Your judgment is as good as mine as to whether that would actually sell. But that, that uh, is a very fine report with very detailed recommendations. It was submitted to the, government, to, the, to the governor only in 2014 or something like that, 2014. So it's, uh, it's two years, so we don't know what, what exactly is going to happen on that score. But I don't think bankrupting is, is going to happen. The, the real danger is that we don't tackle the problem. I, I would be much more concerned if we... Hmm? No, I don't think that fixing the banks, by the way, will not lead to a fall in the value. Of, when you say the fall in the value of the rupee that has happened, that's just... We're not running a fixed exchange rate. I mean, exchange rates are moving all over the place. In fact, uh, in a way, the dollar has appreciated too much. Uh, some of the newspapers have been reporting, and there are efforts being made to bring it down. So the rupee is just, it's, it's fallen in value relative to the dollar, but virtually everybody has fallen relative to the dollar. We should not, in my view, expect uh, uh, to treat the fixity of the currency as a sign of strength. Let me just go back to 2012 when we had a, a major current account problem. You know, the, the current account deficit 
in 2012 had gone up to about 4.7% of GDP, whereas in the 1991 crisis when we had to go to the IMF, it had only gone to 3.4. In spite of it being 4.7, because we had a flexible exchange rate, which moved, de de depreciated, and created a lot of furor, then it appreciated again, we were able to control that problem without having to go to the IMF at all. So flexible exchange rates have a lot of uh, gain. I think what banks, businessmen need to realize is that they should not take on foreign exchange exposure without hedging it. Now, every time the rupee depreciates, all the treasury guys say, oh, we never, never take it on in the future. But after it's stable for a while, they happily go and do that. I'm told that you know, most businesses, they don't hedge more than 10% of their foreign exchange exposure, which is not a good thing. They ought to hedge much more. <coughs> Sir, uh, you have already talked a little bit about NPA. My question is that we heard about cash stash. We also talked about NPA. And there is uh, corruption. Dr. Bimal Jalan had written on one book if the corruption reduces by some percentage, GDP will grow. What is your take on the need for ethics in financial leadership? Sorry, what's my faith on? Uh, need for ethics in financial leadership. I, I missed that. Uh. Need for ethics. ethics. Sir, you see, in PA you have talked a little bit. Then we talked about cash stash abroad, a lot of money there. And then Dr. Jalan wrote in one book that if corruption can be reduced by some percentage, GDP will grow. So how do you take the role of ethics? You know, I mean, look, there's no, I haven't read Jalan's book, so I don't know, I don't want to co comment on something that I'm not familiar with, but uh, there's no doubt that I, I tend to take the view that uh, the presence of corruption lowers growth and lowers efficiency because it actually creates a lot of unfair competition. <clears throat> now, how much it lowers growth and how much it lowers, I don't know. But you know, just from a moral point of view, corruption should be reduced whether it affects growth or doesn't affect growth. So I think the need to control corruption should be on moral and ethical grounds. I think it's also true that it, it discourages efficient businessmen from doing what they have to do because the feeling is that you will be outcompeted by guys who are not actually efficient but are somehow getting un, undue favors. So that's, but how to control corruption, that's a much bigger, bigger issue. And I think you need a second leadership lecture. Uh, <laughs> not by me, but by someone who's really knowledgeable on that to do it, you know. Rajesh Nath from the German Federation. I had, sir, two questions. You had emphasized about the infrastructure. In fact, in your statement, you a couple of times mentioned about infrastructure. Now in the 12th plan, uh, the spending in infrastructure was planned for about $1 trillion, where there was supposed to be an active participation also of the private sector. Mm -hmm. Now this spending has not been realized to that extent and the private sector's role also in the infra spending has been quite low. So what is your take on this and how do we because it's a catch-22 situation. We talk, keep on talking about infrastructure problems, but how are we going to resolve these problems when we are not able to, the intention is good, but we are not able to implement that? <coughs> no, that's a very good question, and I'm glad you raised it. You're absolutely right that, um, you know, most plans are just a sort of scaling up of uh, whatever was done in the previous plan. But if somebody had asked me, what is it in the 12th plan that you think was not just a scaling up, it was that. The huge increase in infrastructure, but more than that, increasing the percentage of PPP to 50%, whereas in the previous plan we only did 30. We were actually aware that this is being a little too ambitious, and, but you know, planning is about um, uh, a, uh, dreaming the impossible dream and then learning when it doesn't work. So I'm quite clear in my mind that uh, signals came very early that this, this was becoming a problem. And I, I mean, certainly I would say that in, uh, at the time that the plan was actually approved, it was clear that this was a problem. And we had actually proposed to the previous government 
that some inter-ministerial mechanism was necessary to take care of some of the uh, conflicts between different ministries. I'll come to those. They did set up some mechanism, but then the term of the government came to an end and the new government came. They're also grappling with the same problem. I don't think there's a difference of assessment uh, that this is a problem and that the government must do something about it. Now, what were the problems? First problem was that um, environmental clearances. You know, uh, these would, uh, a lot of projects were pushed in the belief that, you know, environmental clearances will come. Uh, but somehow the system was such that those clearances didn't come. And I think that, you know, here opinions vary in the sense that if you talk to environmental activists, they feel that none of these clearances should have come because the environment is very important. If you talk to other people, they feel that the environment people do not take a problem resolution type of point of view. I mean, it's not that the private sector guy is always saying the right thing. But you can always say to the private sector guy, listen, if this is what you want to do, this isn't going to work, but you better do it this way. So what would happen is you just say no. And nobody's sitting there trying to solve. This was one problem. I think that has now been taken care of. The previous government started to give clearances. The present government is giving and so on. But I think two or three things happened. Number one, many private sector people bid very aggressively for projects, thinking that they would always be able to get money at cheap rates. The revenues would be high. I mean, they looked at the growth rate of the past and they said, now we're going to get 10% growth. <laughs> and therefore, the bids for the projects were inherently unviable. That's point number one. Point number two is that it's clear that some of the, some of the promoters are probably siphoning money out. Banks were lending money. It was being siphoned away. Uh, and then the project was being shown as not having enough. Mean, this is a problem. Third problem really was that... Uh, when these projects started, uh, the expectation was that they would be able to complete them very quickly. Uh, and very often, that ran into all kinds of constraints other than environment. Okay? So these are, these are some of the problems. I think a third, fourth problem, actually. You know, private sector people, and I think this is a very genuine problem which the government has to think about. Private sector people said that, look, a private-public partnership is a partnership. And you are agreeing that we will do this, that, and the other for 30 years. It's very difficult over 30 years to know what strange things are going to come up. And if some very unexpected thing is going to come up, then maybe you have to rethink, you know, what is reasonable. Now, if this was, if you had a similar relationship between two private sector people, they would come to a reasonable solution. Because they would say, well, yeah, he's got a point, and anyway, what are my options? I mean, you know, the chap has done half the job. <clears throat> I don't want to take it over. I don't want to find someone else to do it. It's reasonable, let's do it. In government, that becomes very difficult, in the sense that if a fellow has signed on the dotted line, that I'm going to do this, that, and the other, and then comes back to you and says, because of this reason, I can't. Now, either it's in the contract that, you know, if the, or some price goes up, then your revenue share goes down. If it's not in the contract, it's virtually impossible for a civil servant to say, on a balance of considerations, he has a point, so let him off. And so the private sector chaps used to say that you fellows are not partners. You call it private-public partnership, but after that, you're really policemen. And that's true. And by the way, there's a good reason why it's true, because the Prevention of Corruption Act, I don't think most people are aware of this, but the Prevention of Corruption Act, I forget section 13, D3 or something, one of the things that suffices to establish that a civil servant is corrupt, I mean, most of the things are very reasonable. You got some money, you got a favor, your wife got a favor, your brother got a favor, your nephew got a favor. You know, all of that should be called corruption. But one of the things that is called corruption is if the other party got a benefit which was not in the public interest, then you are corrupt, 
even if you haven't benefited, your wife hasn't benefited, your cousin hasn't benefited, nobody's benefited. Now, in that environment, how do you determine that, you know, yes, we should relax this fellow's uh, requirement to give some money because circumstances have changed. No civil servant is in a position to do that. So I think what you need to do is probably have a superior dispute resolution mechanism. Because remember, when a dispute happens, the guy says, listen, I can't do this. This is not fair. You better reduce what I have to pay you. And the chap says, no, no, I can't reduce. You agreed to it. No, you must pay. So he's already on record saying you must pay. Now, how on earth is he going to change his mind? The only way it can happen is if a dispute goes to a superior dispute resolution body. But remember, even that dispute resolution body would be subject to the same Prevention of Corruption Act. Now, the previous government had moved an uh, amendment, which is lying in Parliament somewhere. And I think the present government is also in favor of it, which removes this requirement. <clears throat> that is, if you benefited from giving some favors, you're definitely corrupt. But if you gave a favor, you didn't benefit at all. You can accuse the fellow of incompetence, but you can't accuse him of corruption. That amendment is not yet passed. And by the way, I feel that if you really want to get government to act rapidly, amendment of the Prevention of Corruption Act is absolutely vital. Now, uh, somebody talked about banks. Uh, recently, the Supreme Court in a judgment has deemed that even managers of private sector banks are subject to the Prevention of Corruption Act. So you talked about the banking system being stuck. If this becomes uh, firmly established, I don't know what will happen to the private banking system. So too many of our laws are really not geared to, and you know, this is a high level issue. And I can see that governments don't like amending the Prevention of Corruption Act because they'll immediately be accused that you have some ulterior motive. So, you know, this must be, I don't know, Bengal Chamber or somebody must take these matters up. By the way, there is no, there's no consistent voice from industry telling the government, any government, the present government, no consistent voice of industry saying that if you want effective implementation please amend the uh, uh, Prevention of Corruption Act. And I think th these are, you know, otherwise everyone talks about you must be speedy, you must decide things fairly, <laughs> but under those laws it won't happen. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> so there's a gentleman in the back there who's been uh, yes. waiting for a while. Go ahead. Yes, Dr. Alu, earlier. <coughs> please identify yourself. Yeah, my name is Shedding. I'm with Air India. Uh, you mentioned at factory level, we are fairly competitive. It is basically the infrastructure and logistics which has been the major constraint. And uh, when you look at the entire Northeast, the seven sister states, it is connected to the mainland India by a narrow strip called the Chicken's Neck, which is barely about 22 kilometers. In this kind of a scenario where <coughs> What is, would you take beyond whether we should look at the air connectivity of the Northeast? Should we invest more in the airports and the air connectivity? Or look at more uh, expensive option of, you know, doing a multimodal kind of a thing on a very t tough terrain? So just yeah. wanted to <coughs> No, no, I, I fully uh, share your view. Uh, in fact, um, the logistical difficulties of giving the Northeast easy access to the rest of the country's market is a major impediment to more rapid development of the Northeast. Uh, I know that when we were in, when our government was there, a very considered strategy was brought in to improve infrastructure connectivity, rail network. This is still happening and it, I mean, I'm glad that we started it I believe that it is still underway and the present government is pushing it too. So that will happen. But actually, if you ask me, seamless transit through Bangladesh is really what we should be aiming at. Uh, no question in my mind. The saving in transport 
if we could access the northeast or the no northeast could access the main uh, rest of the country uh, through Bangladesh, it would make a huge difference. 